but I didn't really hear what he said. And I don't know cars, even though I'm from Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought he said man charger. And the ad ran man charger. He called me in his office. He was like, (laughs) man charger? What is a man charger? I said, I thought that's what he said. He says, no. I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. He says, no, you need to listen and repeat back what they're saying. In this episode, you'll get to know Pam Perry, the PR angel, and you'll hear the story of how her love of making connections led to her becoming one of the most prolific PR agents in the world. I'm Dave Crenshaw, and this is My Success Show. Welcome back, friends, to the Dave Crenshaw Success Show. This is where I speak to some of the most successful people I've met in my life's journey, and I'm on a mission to find universal principles of success to help you and to help my family be successful. In case it's your first time here, I'm a best-selling author. I speak around the world to Fortune 500 companies, and my courses online have taught millions of people how to be successful. This show was started as a project, as a way to help my kids be successful, and it's just turned into something that's helped a lot of people learn how they can grow in their careers. And I interview people who have success in multiple areas of their life, not just career or financial. As you listen to this, I have a request. I make this request for every episode. Look for something you can do. What's an action that you can take so that you can make my guest's success story a part of your success story? And you're going to want to do that with today's guest, Pam Perry. Pam is an award-winning communications professional. She helps thought leaders build their platform and get publicity. She's also the publisher of Speakers Magazine and the host of Get Out There and Get Known podcast. Pam Perry works hard to help her clients gain publicity and has had placements in Essence Magazine, Black Enterprise, CNN, PBS, CNBC, and NPR. Pam is a Motown girl, and she lives in Detroit with her husband, her daughter, and her dog. Pam, thank you for being here. Thank you, Dave, for having me. I'm excited. And you're in Detroit, so you've lived there your entire life? Born and bred all the way through. Motown girl from the (laughs) 60s, actually. So, yeah. So, I actually grew up seeing some of those temptations and the Supremes in the neighborhood, right? Oh, my gosh. I'm envious of that. That's fantastic. I've got a background in music. And honestly, that was a style that was very inspiring to me. Yes, yes. Barry Gordy was the one that I probably had the most admiration for, even though I love the other stars, Stevie Wonder, all that smoky. But Barry Gordy took these kids, those kids, and made them superstars. That has a lot to do with what I do now today. Yeah. And that's a legacy that'll last forever. That's pretty inspiring. So speaking of growing up in Detroit, I always like to ask the question, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I'm not talking about when you were a small child. I'm talking about when you first really kind of got an idea of what the workplace was going to be like. You were a teenager. What was your aspiration at that time? At the time, I was looking in magazines and in the back of every magazine, they had these classified sections like, you know, you could be a travel agent, you could be this. So I was always looking at what I thought was fun jobs. You know, you can be a model, you could do this. And so just whatever was in the back of the magazine, I would just cut out the coupon and send off for more information. And then I would look at the information would come in the mail. It's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. (laughs) But I would continue to look at the magazines, like hawk them, like, okay, what do I really want to do? And I realized I like the magazine. I like journalism. I like the feature stories. So yeah, that was my thing. I was hooked on magazines, still hooked on magazines. Especially during that time, I really was reading Glamour. Essence had just come on the scene. Ebony Magazine. My mother was in Jet Magazine. So Jet came every week. At that time, I think it was 50 cents a magazine. Oh, wow. You know, they used to have a jet center for it. I don't know if you remember that. It was kind of like the swimsuit kind of thing. You open it up. and Okay. Oh, yeah. So she was one of those. I never aspired to do that. That was not like my thing. But I did like the person that produced the production of the entire magazine. It was like a montage of the best stories. So growing up, I really liked telling the stories. That was the magazines. I mean, my house now really is still filled with magazines. You can probably find some of those old magazines around here. I can't <laughs> throw them away. 
That's fascinating. That's not a backstory that I've heard before, but it's exciting to see that. It's your exposures to the world. You see lots of different things and it's beautiful and in color. And where did you first start getting the taste of doing something like that? Did that happen in high school? Did that happen in college? It probably happened in high school. I went to a school where people came from all over the city of Detroit. And I was at Cass Tech at the high school there. We had 4,000 students in the school. And my main thing is in order to find your voice there, you had to create something. And so I created a club there and we had a magazine. And the first club was the Ladies of Vogue, obviously taken from the Vogue. So I created the magazine where we would take pictures of ourselves and then make Xerox copies of it and we would sell it. That was the Ladies of Vogue. And then we would throw parties. So we were trying to be like Vogue and be the models. And I would put together the stories. And then the other club was a business club. And I would put together stories about how to really survive in business or how to get a co-op job or how to interview or how to write resumes. That was when I realized that's what I like to do. I like to write and go into journalism. That was it. People would always tease me now. It's like, she's always got papers in her hand. (laughs) Was there a lesson? I know that there are things that happen in our past, even all the way back then. And we go, you know, that was a moment where I learned something valuable. Was there something that you learned even during that high school time period where you go, that still applies. I still use that every day. It was me being on the school newspaper. Remember I said I had like 4,000 students. So I was Mm -hmm. on the newspaper and I realized how much, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but how much power is in the media. And so people would treat me really nice (laughs) (laughs) because I was on the newspaper and they were trying to influence getting stories written about them. Or if I was writing a story, they were trying to influence it. I would write a positive story about them. And that was just really interesting to me that I was just a regular person, but I had the power of the newspaper, which went out to 4,000 students, which is probably bigger than most other small town newspapers. But that part right there was when I kind of felt like, ooh, this is a big responsibility in order to share a story out to people. And it's really the choice of whoever is behind the pen or the typewriter, whatever, at that time. So that was like the biggest one. And I remember the mock elections in high school, the most likely to succeed or whatever, whatever. And people would really, I won't say they were bribing, but they were basically like trying to position themselves like, you know, I think such and such should be most likely to succeed or they should be class cute or they should be class whatever. And it's like, okay, because it was our choice. We, as editorial committee, we picked those people. So that was where I kind of said like, wow, there is a lot to positioning, even though I didn't know that's what I called it back then, but positioning someone because if they're most likely to succeed, they feel like they're most likely to position themselves better to do whatever they want to do in life or most likely to whatever. That was interesting. Class clown. They were like, eventually I want to be a comedian, so I need to be class clown. Yeah. Having the power of the media behind you is a very interesting thing. Then that's why I chose that career. I'd never thought about that before. So let's take that moment or that principle and just kind of, for a second, we're going to fast forward to where we are now. Can you tell when someone's being genuine versus just trying to get publicity? Absolutely. (laughs) How can you tell the difference? I guess that was been a natural trait, I guess I could say. That's been something that I just can pick up right away. One of the ways where people who, quote unquote, especially in social media, so now we're talking about a whole digital thing, but when people say, oh, you know, I love to be a part of your program or I'd like to be part of your magazine, I want to be on your show, whatever, and they have no interest in anything that I'm doing it's all about them. So you can see when it's just one way. Yes. So I'll give an example. There was one person in particular, I won't say their name, but they were just like, oh, I'd love for you to get me on Oprah and love for you to do this, this and this and, you know, get me on all these shows and Sherry Shepard, whatever. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, well, this is the cost. I said, ooh, that's a lot of money. It's like, well, don't do it for free. This is a business. And so I said, well, there's another opportunity where you could do this. It's in the magazine that I produce every month. Oh, you have a magazine? I'm like, okay, you know what? You're trying to come to me and I have this magic wand. Pam has this magic wand, right? Ooh, ooh, 
If you're just yeah. listening, she's actually holding up a lighting magic wand. Yeah, they think I have a magic wand. Ooh, give me on Oprah. Ooh, give me on Sharon. Give me on Tamron Hall. And you have no rapport with me or mm. what that show is about. Anything. I can tell that they're just really in it for themselves. They're very self-absorbed, very egotistical. Those are the people that you don't want to deal with because now you see they're really not trying to make a difference. It's just all about them. And I can see that from way off. I can see that from way off. I don't know how I see it, but I just do. And I would say too, that that's just sort of a general thing is sometimes people will approach me on LinkedIn, right? And they'll want something or they're selling something. And I can tell that they didn't even take 30 seconds to look up who it was they were talking to. Google. Yeah, really. It would have taken just a moment and they would have realized, oh, what they're proposing is so far away from what it is that I do. And I think that's a great principle to keep in mind is as you're building connections, you got to do the research. You got to spend some time getting to know who it is that you're trying to connect with and what a media outlet really wants because they all want something different, right? Yes. And that is so true because a lot of the media that I place has to do with personal relationships. It is not because the person has a great book or they have a great story. It is based on a personal relationship. So I can text someone and say, hey, this is a great story. I was a great story for them, but I can text them or I can call them on the phone and say, hey, this is your next big story. And that just comes over time. Obviously, when I first started, I didn't have those connections. But the thing that I will say is that you never discount anyone based on the level that you think that they are, meaning that, oh, well, they're just a small newspaper or, oh, it's just a small podcast. And then you treat them like they're not worth your time, but you will find maybe in two years, they're a producer for ABC Nightline <laughs> or, yes. or they are working for the New York Times. And you just never know. So all of the relationships that I had from when I first started in marketing and PR and all of that, those same friendships, they are now like communications director for the city of Detroit, or they are working for USA Today. But when we started, they were just at some rinky-dink place, right? Yeah. But it didn't matter because I knew them as a person. And that's what I'm saying. People have to know people and like people as a person. Right. And I think just the general principle of treating other people with respect in general, no matter what it is. And then if you do that, those sort of things will happen. I know that happened with my agent and connections that he had in the publishing industry and they've evolved over time. Okay. So you went to college at Wayne State. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Wayne State, which is a city school. It's the city school right in the heart of Detroit. And what did you study there? Actually, I was kind of conflicted a little bit because I liked journalism. And then within journalism school, you can pick different majors or different, you know, like the journalism is a school and then you can pick it. So I picked advertising and PR. Okay. So I said, Ooh, it's two. Okay. <laughs> so it's like advertising and PR in a journalism school. So I had to learn journalism overall, but my concentration was in advertising and PR. Yeah, it was in a journalism school, which I love because it was like, ah, some everything. I worked at the school newspaper. I worked at the radio station and I worked in the advertising department of the school newspaper. So I was conflicted because all of it sound fun. So I didn't really figure it out until I graduated. No matter what your career is, your foundation of success begins with one thing, effective time management. And thanks to the generosity of Microsoft, you can get my entire course, Time Management Fundamentals, for free on LinkedIn Learning. Go to davegift.com to get your free access now. This is the course that millions around the world have used to become more productive and reduce stress. Everyone from Fortune 500 executives to freelancers to students. Now, it's the same coaching I've provided in person for tens of thousands of dollars per day, but you can get it for free on LinkedIn Learning. You don't need to provide anything to access it. No credit card, no email. Just go to davegift.com and start learning. Thank you so much, Microsoft and LinkedIn Learning, for your partnership. davegift.com
And was there a particular mentor or a particular teacher who really inspired you during that time? Absolutely. The first mentor, which I still keep in touch with him today, was someone who was a Wayne State alum. And I was, again, on the newsletter committee for the alumni magazine. And I interviewed Joe Gretsch. And Joe actually was working at the Detroit Free Press at the time here went to Wayne State, majored in journalism, but he was working at the Detroit Free Press. And I interviewed him for the alumni newsletter. And my first job before I got out of college, actually about six months before I got college, he hired me. And I was working in classified advertising at the Detroit Free Press. But I was just so excited just to work at the Detroit Free Press. I didn't care what department it was. And Joe was my mentor. He was my boss. And I remember going to that job. It was so funny. It was a phone room, basically. It's like I'm taking ads copy, mm. right? And I would bring this big suitcase, Samsonite suitcase to work and it had my lunch in it because I wasn't doing nothing. I didn't, you know, but I was trying to be. <laughs> but it looks good. Yeah, it looks good. You it know, looks like you nice. You dress the way you're supposed to go, you know? So that was, yeah, that was, yeah, sure. that was the whole thing. But yeah, he was my first mentor and I still keep in touch with him because I stayed at the Free Press for seven years, worked my way up. And then by the time I left, I was a feature writer for the classified section. And then also I worked in the advertising department and advertising. And what's something that he taught you that you go, I'm still grateful for that lesson? Listen to people. Mm. (laughs) Listen to people because I'm on the phone all day. And so I can't talk. They're calling to tell me about what kind of ad they want. And so I can't just project onto them what they're saying. I've got to listen and then actually put together. So that kind of skill was really important that he taught me. I remember one time I got an ad and it was for a Ram charger. But I didn't really hear what he said. And I don't know cars, even though I'm from Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought he said man charger. And the ad ran man charger. He called me in his office. He was like, (laughs) man charger? What is a man charger? I said, I thought that's what he said. He says, no. I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. He says, no, you need to listen and repeat back what they're saying. I was like, Mm, a man charger. No, it's a Ram charger car, not a man charger. So yeah, he taught me how to listen and really take time with people. Did you encounter any adversity in that first job that you had with the Detroit Free Press? Yeah, and I was so ready. You know, when you graduate from college, you're so ready to be like the next executive, right? So it's like, I can't stand being in this phone room. It's like, this is not what I want to do. And I was kind of bucking the system in a way because the other people in the phone room, they didn't have degrees. I had a degree. And, you know, so it was like that little tension. And Joe really had to say, listen, you may have your degree now. Because remember, I started six months before I graduated. You may have your degree now, but it's not an automatic. You're going to get promoted. Okay. You've got to earn your worth. And what he did is that he put me in like a trainee program. And so after I graduated, I was a trainee. So I went from being in the classified department, actually working as a full-time person to like a trainee. So it kind of went down a little bit and I was like, oh my God. So now I'm like the trainee. But eventually that year being a trainee, then I worked my way up into the next level, which was account executive. So it was a little, I guess you would say humility I had to learn about myself once I got my degree because I'm thinking like, I have my degree, so I should be able to get promoted. And he was like, "Uh uh-uh, no, this is not how this works. So basically, once I graduated and I had that job, I got demoted to a trainee. (laughs) So now you can prove yourself if you're ready to go up. And I stayed at the Free Press for about seven years. I think a lot of young adults have that kind of perception when they start their career, thinking that, you know, hey, I've got the education, but... All it did was get you the job. It doesn't mean that you're going to keep that job. It doesn't mean that you're going to get promoted. You've still got to prove yourself and you've got to continue growing. Mm -hmm. That was what he taught me. He said that you still have to continue. growing. There's so much you don't know that you don't know. And that was it. So at what point did you switch to the other side? And what I mean by that is you were making the news, you were writing it, working for the newspaper, and then you started helping people get placement in the news. What led to that transition for you? That was actually where I saw my heart and my passion really come to life. Because in the advertising department, we were helping people write ads, which I was really good at copywriting. 
we had to sell the ads, first of all. And I like that. I love meeting the people. But what I realized is that the ads are important, obviously, but also the stories are more important. So I would say, hey, you know, you're opening up your new store, but let me introduce you to the business reporter where he can actually write a story about you as well. Now, I can do the ad. Advertising and the editorial are separate, but I do know them because I see them on the elevator or I can walk through their departments, but I can then take them your information. What I can do is like type up some information, give it to them, and they can write a story. That's when I realized the power of advertising and PR, but PR really, the editorial had more of a trust factor with it, more of a credibility because anybody can pay for an ad, but the credibility of a story is really the main thing that people trust. And they were most proud of that. They will frame a story. You're not going to frame an ad, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That's a great way of thinking about it. It sounds like you're someone who also likes to make connections for people. Yeah, that has been always a thing. It That probably has to do with the church I grew up in, with my pastor. He was a connector like that. Even though we had a church of maybe a thousand people or so, he would connect people. And I would see him do that. And then being in that church since I was a child, I learned that as well, how to connect people. If I see people, I would say, hey, you need to meet Dave or you need to meet Stephen or I think you all will have something in common. And that is just a natural thing from growing up under that pastor, seeing him do that within that. Mm. One of the first things in Detroit, when the cable first came to our city, he was connecting people to get jobs within the cable company. And the person who he connected with it is then became like a vice president of Barden Cable, which eventually became Comcast Cable. But he was the one that was connected with that because he was on the cable commission. How does that make you feel when you make that connection for someone? Oh, it's just like, that's what you're here for. Mm. (laughs) That was your purpose. It wasn't for you. It was for them. It just makes you feel really good because that's the purpose why you're here to make that connection. You can meet someone. It's like, oh, okay. And then just put it in your pocket and forget about it. But then you meet someone. It's like you share it. It's like, oh, yeah, that's what that was for. So you just feel like you're divinely connecting people because you're that conduit. Yeah. Is there a moment or one story of where you made that connection that you particularly felt gratified by by doing it? I do. You know, I started another organization after I got out of college, Blacks in Advertising, Radio and Television. It was primarily all of the African-Americans in radio, advertising, radio and television. And we created this whole group. And a lot of people became best friends because we had monthly meetings, career development meetings. And I remember one in particular person, there was a lot, but one was Joe Coleman and Don Spencer, and they became best friends. They were about the same age. One was a radio television advertising executive and one was a radio television executive. They met, they became best friends. They traveled together, their kids grew up, their husbands. I mean, just the whole thing. And they became really, really good friends. Dawn passed. And even like at the funeral, this is how I know, at the funeral, Joe went on and said how Dawn had become her best friend, like her sister. And I was like, they wouldn't have even met if we hadn't had that connection. You know, that's the kind of feeling that because I knew that they were a light in each other's life. They were very similar, Mm. very similar in terms of their energy and everything. They both actually were from Ohio too. So that was another thing. But A lot of situations where I make the connections with people and sometimes I make them and I forget about them and years later they come back and say, hey, you know, we're in business together. We're doing this. And it's like, oh, I had no idea. So you just do it and forget it. But at a certain point in time, it is gratifying. Yeah. You're planting lots of seeds and then you're going to see which of them grow over time. Yeah. I see that you worked for the Salvation Army for a little bit. Talk to me about the challenges that are unique to doing public relations for an organization like that. Yeah, I had an epiphany. After I left the free press, I really wanted to do broadcast because I had some training in that. So I was working for a radio station and I just had an epiphany one day that I was selling air. I wanted to do something more important in my life than just selling air. I don't know what that was. I was hitting 30 and I was like, I want to do something more meaningful. Hmm. And I was running the nonprofit organization, like I said, the advertising group. And I said, I really like nonprofits. So I just really started poking around and looking at other nonprofits that I can work with to tell their stories. 
And I remember I said that to someone. I said, you know, I'm really getting tired of this whole quote unquote radio advertising, newspaper advertising. I want to do something more meaningful. And so someone put me on a board and I was working with the group and eventually the director of public relations, the Salvation Army, that came open and someone suggested me because they'd seen my heart of what I was trying to do. Because again, I was connecting the people who were at the Salvation Army with other media people that I know so they could tell their story. Doing it for free. Sometimes you just have to do things for free. Sure. And I was doing it for free. And then eventually they says, hey, would you like to apply to do this job? And that was actually one of my favorite, favorite jobs. Oh my God. It was the Salvation Army, the bell ringers, telling the story, the newsletter. I mean, just good stories after good stories. And that's what I had to do throughout the whole Michigan area of the Salvation Army. That's when it was over. I had to go find good stories about how the Salvation Army helped people. This brings up an interesting question because you're talking about stories and the power of stories. How do you know when you've got a good story? In other words, you're experiencing all these different things with your client or for your client. How do you know when you go, that's something that the news wants to talk about? And how do you differentiate that from, say, a story that isn't going to move people? It's different. So when you're in the newsroom, it's a little different than if you're PR. So NPR is what they call, sometimes they call them spin doctors, right? Everybody has a good story. It's up to the publicist to spin it so that it spins into gold in terms of how you tell it. Not to say that the journalist doesn't. The journalist basically is like, this is the fact. I don't have to spin it. This is what it is. Take it or leave it. Whereas someone who's a PR is like a cross between the editorial and sales. So you have to sell the story to the media. So you have to make sure it's really good. So everybody has a story. But when I'm listening, I know what it is that the media will pick up. And so I have to take the story from, say, if it's you, I'll take your story and say, oh, that's really good. And I keep digging until I find the gold and then I spin it and send it to the media. And what does the media want? What does make it more interesting and compelling for them? Whatever their audience is looking for. So that's where it comes into really paying attention to if it's the free press, obviously they're looking for more human interest stories in the feature section. They're looking for something that's so heartwarming, mm. that kind of thing. Or if it's a magazine, they're looking for something a little bit more flashy, a little bit more sometimes salacious. It just depends on what media outlet it is. The difference between an NBC station and an ABC affiliate and a Fox affiliate that are different. So you want to feed them what you know that their audience is used to and what their audience would consume. And that takes time to know each media outlet well to know what it is. So right. a lot of times I remember I had a story that ran for the Salvation Army on the front page of the Free Press. Nice. Obviously, I knew somebody at the Free Press, but someone had ripped off one of our bell ringers. They had stole the kettle. Like, really? Mm. Like, somebody steals the kettle? This is Detroit. I'm like, yeah, really? So anyway, so I called my friend that was a reporter at the Detroit Free Press. I said, somebody just ripped off our bell ringer. They just, mm. and so it ran to the front page. Like, you know, someone is stealing the Salvation Army kettle. Anyway, that made donations go up because the whole point of having PR at the Salvation Army is to make sure that donations go up. We did not stage it. Someone did steal the kettle, but that made the front page story. And it, I have to match up the people who they talk to and all that kind of stuff. That's a perfect example of spinning something into gold, right? Right. Everybody else is like, oh, that's terrible that it happened. But someone in PR is like, that's amazing that that happened because now we're going to get more publicity and we're going to make more money and donations than what we lost in that. Yes. Yes. That was it. That was it. Where did you start striking out on your own as a PR agent? While I was at the Salvation Army, I always had a heart to help authors. I don't know why, I just love books. Mm -hmm. And while I was at the Salvation Army, some authors would come through for maybe different programs or whatever, and I would do press releases for them on the side. It says, you need to speak at more places than just us. Here's a press release, send this out. So really there, but it wasn't until after I got married and had a daughter. And while I was home for those six weeks, they said I could come back, but I chose not to. I said, you know what? I think I'm going to strike out on my own. 
during the six weeks, I just, with my daughter, I said, you know what, what do I really want to do? What do I really want to do? It was, you know, my mid thirties. It was like, what do I really want to do? And I said, I really want to work with authors and speakers. Primarily it was authors. Cause if you're an author, you got to speak in order to sell books. So I said, I really want to work with authors. And that's when I opened up my company it was in one of those things where it's like, wow, I think I really want to do this. So that's when it happened. But my husband had his own company, advertising agency. And I said, well, instead of me going back, why don't I work with you and I create your public relations division? Interesting. And he says, okay, okay. So I created his PR division of his advertising agency, which is advertising agency, primarily work with automotive, Detroit, right? Or automotive suppliers. And then here I am with the PR division of like, we're going to work with authors. We're going to work with speakers. We're going to work with nonprofit organizations. We're going to work with these companies that make a difference. So how do you think that worked? <laughs> Probably not as well as you thought. No, because he had one arm of automotive suppliers, cars, automotive supply, steel companies. Blah, blah, blah. And here I am, miss, I want to change the world with the PR. So eventually we went bankrupt. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But part of the economy, but also because we were pulled in two different ways. I was not bringing in the type of clients that was for Perry Marketing Group. I was trying to bring in churches and nonprofits and these authors and people that really didn't have as much money as like the Fords and the GMs, right? Yeah. And you highlight something that I teach which is the importance of focusing on one customer, focusing on that one best, I call it your most valuable customer, your MVC, and building your business around them. Mm -hmm. If you can pick up other customers, great, but you don't want your marketing message to get so jumbled that it's all over the place. And it sounds like that's exactly what you were experiencing. That's exactly what happened. It was all over the place. You can't come in the door and say, oh, Perry Marketing Group, they do all of the work for all the automotive and all the automotive suppliers. And then we've got the PR arm. So can you do PR? Yeah. Yeah. But we really do PR for this. Yeah. There was one client that was sort of in the middle and that was like an award show for automotive executives. That was sort of kind of, but for the most part, I could care less about cars. Maybe that's just me. I just care less about cars. I didn't want to do nothing with cars. It was like, that don't make no difference to me. I drive them. That's it. Well, I think that's important too for your business and also for the marketing is you've got to be passionate about yes. what it is that you're talking about. And the type of people you want to be around. Do you want to be around those automotive executives? Do you want to be around those automotive suppliers? I mean, no shade against them. They're probably great people, but I don't want to spend a lot of time with them. I'd rather spend time with authors and speakers motivational, inspirational speakers, nonprofits that are making a difference in the world. That's just me. That's what I find fun. That's what I think I'm here for. That's my purpose. His, as a kid, you could probably find my husband, his parents will say he was playing with cars. He loved cars. He put together model cars. He loves cars. That was his thing, cars. So it was just different. So that was part of his mission. And then when you're a husband and wife in business together, you may have the skills that can help each other, but do you have the passion for that market? And we didn't. So we went out of business, went bankrupt, had to start over. He went to go get a job at an ad agency. He worked on Ford. He was happy. He loved that. And then I started my company full-time working with um, Ministry Marketing Solutions, Pan Perry PR, working with authors and speakers. So just want to highlight a lesson here that I've learned a mentor taught me, which is what is the secret of success in entrepreneurship? Make sure it's your second time. Mm, <laughs> yeah. You got to have that trial business out of the way first. Sounds like you got that. Woo! That second time too. Let me tell you, the first time we did it, we had an office, we had a receptionist, we had this whole old school, we had a conference room. Da, da, da. Uh -huh. The second time, well, you know what I had? A computer at home and a phone. And a fax. Yes. <laughs> and I made it work. During this time, this was 2000, people weren't working from home. So they would look at me like, oh, that poor thing. She doesn't even have a business. She's working from home. I'm like, yeah, I don't have an overhead anymore. I don't have to pay payroll taxes anymore. I'm working from home. 
this is what people do today. They call it solopreneur, but that was the thing. I did that in 2000. It was way kind of pre-internet. I mean, it was MySpace age. So, you know, it's crazy. So I knew that then that that was how it would fit my lifestyle for the people that I wanted to work with. What highlights too is you were playing the part of a business owner versus actually being a business owner. You know, if someone's listening to this and they're thinking about getting into business for themselves, be slow, bootstrap, don't add all of these additional expenses just to make you feel like you're being a business owner. Mm -hmm. You do not need a conference room. Right. Exactly. You can go to a co-working space. Or be in your house. Yeah. So talk to me about maybe one of the moments that was a challenging moment in growing your business and how you overcame it or what you learned from it. Part of what you said about knowing your niche and really focusing in. So I focused in on ministry marketing solutions, a lot of ministries. This is before ministries really were marketing like they are today. And again, a lot of them weren't on the internet. A lot of them didn't have websites, but they did want to have books. So I would help write books and that kind of thing. When I started, this is the era that I made. And I hope every entrepreneur listens to this is I had a laundry list of things that I did, you know, because I'm a journalist. I could write your book. I could produce your book. I could promote your book. I could do this and this and this. And you have this whole long list. Well, for five years, I was hardly making no money because I had too much that I said I could do, but I wasn't excellent in any of it because I was split. I'm sitting there and I'm trying to write books and then I got to promote the book and then help get the designer to do this. It's way too much. Yeah. So eventually... I learned to just focus in on the part that I like, that I know is my part, that I enjoy, that I know is my secret sauce, that I can do better than anybody. And that's when I started really making money. And that's when I switched over from Ministry Marketing Solutions. And it's really those authors and speakers, it could be Willie Jolly or Les Brown, that have a message to the world. I really realized that I'm doing the publicity for them, the PR, the marketing, the branding for them not necessarily trying to write their book, ghost write the book. That is edit the book, create their website, do their blog, create their podcast. I could, but if I'm going to be someone that produces your podcast, that's like a job all by itself. Yeah. I cannot produce your podcast and also be your publicist and get you in USA Today. And then also edit your book and ghost write it. And then edited it. Yeah, you became a ghostwriter when you said you were going to do that. And you added another thing that you were going to accomplish. And I just want to, for those who are hearing what she's saying about focus, I want to be clear. There were three focuses that you just talked about that someone might miss. Number one, you focused on your kind of work. You focused on the most valuable activity. Then we talked about this before, but you focused on the most valuable customer. I'm going to work with these authors and these speakers. And then you also focused on your most valuable line, as in line of products and services. You stopped doing the ghostwriting. You stopped doing all that. You started focusing on PR. So lots and lots of focus that led to you being more profitable and more successful. Yes, that is so key. And again, social media was on the scene because PR changed. Digital PR is different because PR changed. I had to change with it as well from what the same business. So digital PR became important. So teaching people how to use social media was important. Am I a social media expert? Do I only do social? No, no, I do not. I realized that probably like about 2010. And I would do some seminars on teaching people how to do social media just because I needed them to know how to do it. But I'm not going to sit here and be the one that does their social media. I know that they need to do it and I can tell them another company that will do their social media, but I'm not the social media house where I'm doing all your content creation. I'm a publicist and I create speakers magazine. So I'm real clear, but this is 20 something years in the game that I became clear from failing forward, right? It takes time to figure that out, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It really does. Knowing your avatar is so important and really knowing what is your value proposition. Those are the main two things that you should really know. So you just used a word and I'm familiar with this concept, but for those who aren't quite as familiar, you just said, know your avatar. Mm-hmm. Can you briefly summarize what that means? 
who it is that is your ideal customer, who is going to pay you the money, who has the problem that you can solve for them, who's the customer that you're talking to from day to day. Yeah. When you go into a room and you're networking, you can be in a room full of people, but there's one or two people in that place that is your ideal person that you can hold a conversation with. And by the time you leave that place, they are saying, oh, you are the exact person that I need to solve my problem. Or you can go in and start talking to everybody and try to figure it out. It's like, well, you know, I do this, I do that, I do this, I do that. And you're just trying to find somebody that can just buy your stuff versus like knowing this is the person I'm looking for. This is the person who it is. And part of it is demographics, but some of it is psychographics in terms of what kind of person they are. What they believe in, what their aspirations are, that kind of thing. Yes, really knowing them like a person. I always say you could talk to a person better if you know them. So when people are out creating content, if you know your customer, you can create content very easily versus trying to just guess. So the better you know them, the better you can serve them and create content for them. And I would add to that, put it in writing. Have a document that profiles that person so that when you're working with coworkers, you can say, look, this is who it is. If you want to even give them a name, right? Yes. We're working with Joe. Is this person a Joe or are they a Jane or whatever it is, right? Are they something different? Yes. And then that helps you focus your message, helps you focus your marketing, your conversations, all that. It done. What's something that drives you every day? Where you say, you know what, I'm trying to accomplish this. Or you feel like at the end of the day, you worked and you go, yeah, this was successful because I. The pinnacle for me is really for all the clients or people that are connected to me in my community that they're winning. So whether they are creating their podcast, whether they're in a magazine on a regular basis. So helping them achieve those goals. Everybody has different goals or whether I have one client in particular says, I would love to speak at a Black Enterprise event or Women of Power event. You know, so making those connections happen for them is what I really do. Now, some of them aren't ready. So then I have little steps that I have to make for them to be ready, building their platform, you know, so that they can be ready for those things. But that's what I'm working on every day so that they can reach their goal. And when they do have it, it's like, oh my God, it really happened. It's like, yep. I just need you to tell me the goal. I'll figure out the strategy for you. And that's what I work on. And I'll make the connections for them. I think about my clients a lot, not just during the day, not just during nine to five, but I do think about them and I care about them. So it's like, okay, you tell me your goal, what you really want. I see it, you see it. Now we just have to make it happen. And I really just lay it out and it's like, okay, it may not happen the traditional way. I mean, I just write a press release and pitch it. It may be other ways. That's what's fun to me. It may be where I just say, you know what? I feel like I should call this person right now. And I'll call like maybe a producer friend at Sirius XM. And it's like, yeah, we were just looking for someone, I guess, just like that. And it happens. So that's part of the fun thing because people sit back. And, How did that happen? It's like, I just was listening. <laughs> That first thing is like, just listen, right? Just mm, listen. Yeah. Going back to that principle you learned. Going back to the principle, just listen. And it happened. A big part of these interviews that I do is I'm looking for people who not only have financial and career success, but also have balance with that. They're making time for family. They're having fun. They're doing those kinds of things. So for you, what do you do to make sure that you have multifaceted success and balance in your life? That's interesting because I don't really think there is a balance. I think there's a blend. And when I was choosing a career, you asked me like when I was younger, I was looking for a career that I enjoyed, that I could have fun. And I looked at a career that would allow me to have fun, enjoy my family, enjoy my friends, and to give me the financial freedom that I wanted. I always look for a career in that. I know some people say, well, I want to be a law school because I want to make a lot of money. Then I could do these other. No, I wanted it all blended. Mm. I wanted the whole blend. So the career that I chose gave me that blend where I work with my husband. He's in advertising. Even my daughter, she's in advertising. She's a project manager for an ad agency. 
and she does social media. So it's blended. And then even with a lot of my friends, we're within that industry or they kind of know what I do. A lot of my friends are speakers, they're authors, the financial part, freedom that I have, I'd be able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And then also to just the freedom of being an entrepreneur. Yes, I do work hard, but I enjoy it. So if I'm working in the morning at 9 a.m., maybe I'll take a break during the day, but then I may be back working on something at 9 p.m. That's my choice because I just enjoy it. It's not a big deal because I know that I don't have a time clock. That's something that I found that was a big value of mine was freedom. So I would say if there's things that you don't love to do, if you're an entrepreneur, then figure out a way where you don't do them. You delegate it. You hire someone else to do it, but do the things that you love to do. And that's when you'll always find joy. Do those things. I don't do it if I don't love it. So do you have other things that you pursue outside of work for fun? You know, I love what I do. So, I mean, I travel and things like that, but it's not like I have a whole nother little hobby of like, oh, I'm a great chef or I'm an artist or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a wine connoisseur. No. I dance. So I will say that I do love to dance. That's one of my things. So two or three times a week, I'll take like hustle classes or Zumba classes and things like that. So that's what movement is always fun for me. But travel. That's great. Even if you love your job, having something else that you transition to refreshes the mind, refreshes the body, and it gives you new perspective to be more successful in the things that you're doing, no matter what it is that you do. So One last question. What do you see five years ahead? Where do you want to be five years into the future with your career? I really want to turn this over Mm. to my project manager daughter, right? These kids, sometimes they really don't want to be entrepreneur, like as a legacy entrepreneur, like they want to carve their own way. Sure. But I'm going to make it so that eventually one day she'll say, you know what? I will take it over. And I do want to do this because I think she has the skills. But sometimes when your kids are so much like you that they need to break away from you to find their own way. So that's what she's kind of doing right now. Like, you know, I can find my own way. But listen, if my mother, my mother was a housewife, if my mother had a company and I knew that in a few years I could take it over for her, I would definitely put my hand up and say, yes, that's me. But this generation of younger people in their 20s are different. But I would say in five years, I would love to just let her take it over. And then I support her in whatever she needs. I love it. That's a great vision. Okay. So Pam, in every episode, what I do is I wrap up with action. And what I always ask my listeners to do is to not just hear the story as wonderful as the story is, and not just get to know you, but find a way that they can do something based on your example and not something in the future, not something a year from now, something they can do today or this week. So they make your success story a part of their success story. So I'm going to come up with three things, possible actions that I noticed during this. And then I'd like at the end, if you would add one thing that you think they could do today or this week that maybe I didn't cover in those. Sound good? Okay. So the first thing that I wrote down or noted was be interested in others Mm -hmm. and listen to others. And that's something that you do so well. You listen, you pay attention to what they want, and you're curious about others. And that allows you to build relationships. So my suggestion for an action would be think about an upcoming conversation that you're going to have today, tomorrow, and Make a goal for yourself to be more interested and to listen more and pay attention to it. And then that way you can start practicing that principle. Another principle that I wrote down was looking for the stories in your life and in your career. So an action that you could take is think about the last week and just pause for a moment and think for five to 10 minutes, what are the things that happened to me at work? And Maybe think of, is there a story in here? Is there something interesting? Even if you're not in publicity, even if you don't need to promote a book, telling stories is powerful. It helps you build connections with people. And it also adds, I think, color and flavor to your life. So maybe you can just write down a few notes. This is the story. This is what happened. 
And then the last one, I have to focus on this, and that's what it is. It's focus. Focus on what you like. Focus on what you're passionate about and say no to all the other things. As great as they are, saying no and being more focused is going to make it easier for you to be successful. So think about all the different things that you're doing at work or if you have a business as an entrepreneur and think, how can I say no to one thing? How can I reduce how much time I'm spending on that one thing? And naturally, by saying no to something else, you're going to be saying yes more often to those things that are most valuable. That's what stood out to me. Pam, what would you add as a possible action for people? I would say I love communities. You grow from communities. I would say find a group. Don't work in a silo. Find a group that is would stretch you or a group that you would want to work with, a group you maybe want to speak at, or a group you want to maybe lead a committee. So say, for instance, maybe you want to be a part of a chamber of commerce. Let's just say that's everybody. If you're in business, you want to be a part of a chamber of commerce. Join the chamber of commerce in your area. Be involved. And maybe you want to be a part of the membership committee. You want to be a part of the event programming committee. You want to be a part of whatever committees they have. But be involved in the group. Go with the idea of giving rather than getting. So yes, you want to definitely grow your business, but go to join a chamber of commerce or any kind of organization and say, okay, I'm going to be part of this committee. I'm going to actually sow some time into this group and you will just see how things will blossom from there because it is so important to join a group or uh, organization and get involved. Don't just join it on paper. You know, a lot of speakers, well, I'm a member of the National Speakers Association or I'm a member of the Black Speakers Association. It's like, okay, well, what are you doing there? So you need to be a part of it and really grow from there and build relationships from there. So I would say find a group or organization, whether it's a online community or if there is not an organization that you say would really be your people, then create it. Create your own group. If you can't find your people in another group out there, then that must mean that you must be the one that needs to create the group. And that's what I've done over the years, I've created groups because there wasn't a group that I felt really was like, quote unquote, the people that needed the information or the inspiration within the group. So create the group. That's really so, so important today, especially today in the digital world. Yeah. I love that principle. And none of us are successful on our own. We need that community. We need other people. Uh, Pam, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show and thank you for generously sharing your story with us. If someone wants to continue to learn from you and follow up with you, where's the best place for them to go to do that? They can go to pamperrypr.com. PR stands for public relations. So pamperrypr.com. I'm really clear now. Thanks to listen to my own story about how clear that is now. So yeah, pamperrypr.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Pam, for being here. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Remember, it's not so much about what you heard. It's about what you do. So go do something about what you heard from Pam today, and you'll make her success story a part of your success story. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Dave Crenshaw Success Show, hosted by my dad, Dave Crenshaw, and produced by Invaluable Incorporated. Research and assistant production by Victoria Bidez. Sound editing by Mark Lammer Jay Z. Voiceover by me, Darcy Crenshaw. And the music is by Ryan Brady via Pond 5 licensing. Please subscribe to the Dave Crenshaw Success Project on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to get your podcasts. If you have a suggestion for someone my dad might like to interview, please send it to guest at davecrenshaw.com. And please don't forget to leave us a five-star review. See you next time.